um, often nowadays. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with cartooning in, at this point in time, but it seems that the word is graphic novel right now. But um, I grew up in the era when we were cartoonists, and I've stuck to it. I think of it as a good, unpretentious kind of title. And um, to get, before I start talking, just to give a bit of a flavor of, um, a bit of what my work's like, I'm going to show a short animated feature. Um, uh, this was made by a man named uh, Luke Chamberlain, and this is from a documentary about me from a year ago called Seth's Dominion. So uh, we'll watch that little cartoon first. The Creek. I suspect many people have had a place like this in their childhood. A place where they encountered the natural world without the watchful eye of an adult. A place that remains unnaturally vivid in the imagination. The creek was within easy walking distance. Just beyond a new subdivision, on the edge of town. A wild area of little streams in the shadow of the bush. Over a fence and into a grassy field, and in that field a pond, simply brimming with life. Dragonflies, painted turtles, water striders, four-legged beetles, and of course, frogs. Frogs in all stages of their lives. Always so startling to see them on the threshold of being that final creature. In the field, the milkweed, the cattail, and wheatgrass, Queen Anne's lace, the skunk cabbage, and in the bush, the trillium. The trillium held a special fascination. Being the provincial flower, we were forbidden to pick it. Schoolyard lore warned that if a trillium was picked, it would bleed red blood. I promised never to touch one. I purchased an old postcard of Strathroy, Ontario, postmarked 1909, the old swimming hole. Was this the same spot? Had we inherited it and its name? Was I just one of a long line of boys who played and swam there? I remember how unpleasant the creek bottom felt with just bare feet. The mud and the reeds and the crayfish skittering between your legs. I remember how it felt to be there when you were in a group and how different it felt to be there alone. When I returned as an adult in the 1990s, the creek was unchanged. It was eerily familiar. However, when last I visited, the bush had grown so thick, I couldn't even get near. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. Um, basically, I'm going to just talk off the cuff um, about my uh, career and my work, and um, we'll just see where it goes. So when I, um, one of the things that I, I tell whenever I'm talking to a younger crowd is I try to explain how different the world of cartooning was when I was a child compared to what it is now. Well, I grew up in a small town in Ontario, and really um, the two kinds of cartooning you came in contact with were the newspaper strips, like Peanuts, as you see there, or comic books. And mostly they were superhero comic books at that point back in the 1970s. There were no comic book shops then, and there were no graphic novels, and there were no uh, reviews of comics in the, in the New York Times. It was a very um, lowbrow medium, and it was pretty much considered a child's medium. It was uh, produced for kids, and I grew up like ki all kids who ended up want becoming a cartoonist. I grew up wanting to draw Spider-Man or Captain America, and I or, you know, and I was a huge Peanuts fan. This is what you thought of cartooning, and this is why you decided to be a cartoonist. And I spent my teen years um, 
laboring away in my bedroom, drawing like superhero comic books of my own, planning that when I got older, that's what I would do. And I went to art school um, because I figured um, that's what you do when you got to the end of high school. You had to go to school somewhere. So I went to art school, and um, when I got there around 1980, um, it was a very hostile environment towards cartooning. Um, we were coming out of uh, kind of, the, you know, the leftovers of pop art, and certainly a lot of minimalist art, and um, kind of an, um, installation art was very big at that point, and certainly the figure was frowned upon, drawing the figure, and nothing could have been more frowned upon than wanting to draw comic books. It really, my, I was very discouraged because um, generally uh, the professors did not think much of it, and even my other students weren't very impressed. The other students weren't very impressed. But uh, the interesting thing was I went into the commercial design department because I figured that would be the closest thing to, to comics because I could learn to, you know, they were still doing illustration and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it did seem like a funny thing was going on at that point in comics, and that's that they were dying. Um, this is something I hadn't even thought about when I was, as a teenager, that I thought, you know, this is a big mass medium. You'd go to the corner store and you'd buy some comic books, and it seemed to me that these were big things. But the funny thing was is that they were really, at that point, it was the end of a long history of, of like publishing. Comic books had been very big back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, but it had been in decline. And it was interesting that what happened at that point in the 80s, as it went into decline, is what often happens to a commercial medium when it starts to become um, not a mass medium anymore, and that's that it became an art medium. And it was around that point that um, across North America and the world, a handful of uh, people who wanted to be cartoonists like myself decided that they were still interested in the form, but they'd outgrown the content. So I knew that I didn't want to draw Spider-Man anymore, but I didn't really know what I did want to do. And um, it was around this time I started to discover some of the work that was being published by uh, artists that were just a year or two older than me. This is Raw Magazine, and Raw Magazine was a big, beautiful art magazine, basically, that was put out by um, Art Spiegelman and Frances Mouly. And basically what it was, was a, um, a redefining, a very a bold redefining of comics to make, to try and say, like, these are for adults. They made it so that it was obviously not for children. It had really good production values. The graphics were very modern at the time. It was very hard-edged, very 1980s, very punk. And, um, and while that was going on, there was also a kind of a smaller, kind of less uh, ostentatious kind of movement in comics going on of trying to do work that was, um, well, realer might be the best word for it. A lot of stuff was drawn from real life, a lot of autobiography. You can see in these images here, um, you've got, uh, down in the corner you see the one that says Love and Rockets, and then kitty corner to it, there's some sort of like punky images. Those were by these two brothers called the Hernandez brothers. They were from California. And they were writing very much about their own experience of being, you know, 23, 25 year old punk rockers. And uh, this was really important work to me at the time because it was my, probably I was it was exactly the right age to read it. I was just that age myself. I was a little punk rocker myself. It was an exciting thing to read comics that were about real life and yet were somewhat fantastical. And uh, it's like you knew I knew instantly that this was a direction that I was interested in, which was to try and look to my own life for the source of information of what I would write about. Also, there you see uh, down in the corner is Linda Barry. Um, at the bottom, and she was a very big influence on me as well because she was doing work in the newspaper, the alternative newspapers at that point, that was very straightforward and earnest and even a bit brutal. And I assumed it to be autobiography, but later it turned out to be it was pure fiction. But that work really taught you could just write about anything you wanted. Um, it was it was literally the kind of thing where you'd say, like, this is giving me license to write about anything anything I want. It's like, it's not about the audience, it's about me, it's the writer. And of course, the most important image there is uh, up in the top corner, which is from Mouse, the graphic novel by R. Spiegel. Um, if you haven't read Mouse, Mouse was a, um, it was an account of his, uh, a memoir of his father's um, history, his father's life in the, uh, during the Holocaust. And uh, Art did it as, um, he used a metaphor of cats and mice, where the, uh, the Jews were the mice. 
And this book had a powerful effect in the real world at how comics were perceived. It didn't happen instantly. Uh, I mean, the book was highly praised everywhere, and he won the Pulitzer Prize, but it didn't change comics overnight. It took many years, because basically it was the only book of its kind at that moment. It took a long time till cartoonists of my age group sort of worked up the, t the energy, the talent, and the experience to produce any of our own books that could be added onto another shelf of graphic novels. Sometime around the turn of the century, that shelf sort of like, I guess, came together. But there were enough graphic novels of worth being published that something changed and uh, graphic novels have become a part of the normal publishing world now. It's actually a remarkable success story that I could not have seen coming. When I started out, it literally felt like that there was no future in what we were doing, but it wasn't, that wasn't really the point. Um, everyone knew they wouldn't make a cent. You weren't going to make a living off of doing these kind of comics, but it, was, uh, it had that it, zeal to it of um, being involved in a new medium that hardly anyone had explored, and um, feeling excited that like you were right there at the beginning. It was like it was an open door. Anything could happen. Up until this point, comics have literally only been used for children. And um, that was like, and the great thing about it was nobody was watching because the audience was small and there were no editors telling you what you could do or what you couldn't do. You literally just did whatever you wanted to do and there was no reason to change it. If somebody's, you know, like now I see there are editors in the comics world and people can say to you, well, maybe you should change that panel, or maybe you should, you know. Back then, you'd be like, well, why should I change it? What am I getting out of it? You're not paying me anything, so I'm gonna keep it exactly the way I like it. And that aesthetic has been very, like, rock solid in the world of comics. I still think a lot of cartoonists think of themselves as the boss, not the publisher, not the editor, that's for sure. I know the big, I, I'm not gonna go too much about my early years and the influences, but a primary influence for me at this point was I started to look back uh, when I talk about Love and Rockets and talk about how exciting it was to read those punk comics when I was a little punk, the other thing that was interesting was to actually like look at the medium you were interested in and say, well, what's this about? What is, what is the history of comics? At that point, you couldn't just go to the library and get a book or look it up online. There literally was very little written about the history of comics. And so almost all the cartoonists of my generation became collectors. You started to buy up old things, you started to look back, and you had to dig. It'd be a lot like if you were a painter and there were no books on the history of painting. So you had to go to the primary sources. And over the 20 years or so of collecting, things have really changed. Now there's many books on the history of cartooning, many individual monographs on different cartoonists. It's much, much easier to, to, um, to know this information now. But the funny thing about that was be, being a, it made everyone in my generation into collectors. And it also made us into curators in a way because we started to like build a canon of who we thought from the past were interesting or good. And um, for me, one of the big things that I was highly interested in was the old cartoonists of the New Yorker, uh, especially the cartoonists from the 20s up until about the 50s. And stylistically, you can see that, like this is Peter Arno here. Yes, this is Peter Arno. And um, big, bold brush strokes and really focused on composition. And, and that artwork, even though it was all just about jokes about society matrons, the actual art itself was like very vital and exciting, and it had a huge influence on how I was drawing at the time. But another interesting change, though, is that culture of being a collector, what's interesting about it is it informs how you think and how you write. Uh, but I've noticed that among the young cartoonists that have come up now, the new art cartoonists, um, they don't feel that desire anymore. They're not collectors and they don't feel um, hampered at all by the canon that we created. In fact, they're disinterested in it. Um, I find it interesting that um, they have the luxury now to not need to connect themselves to history. The history is easily available, and it's a lot like, it's a lot like being a painter. You don't have to study Daumier's work if you don't want to. Um, if you're not interested in it, don't bother. Just pay attention to Franz Klein. Um, in our generation, I think we really felt like we had to dig it all out and had to know it all. It's actually kind of nice to see that the young cartoonists are liberated from that task. And they're doing great stuff. Um, this is a photograph of uh, myself and two other cartoonists. Um, the one in the middle is Chester Brown and the one on the end is Joe Matt. Um, the reason I show these guys here is um, I wanted to talk about how important it is to have peers. Um, it was a very small field, 
And um, you know, like I said, you know, spread out over North America, there were probably less than 50 people, probably closer to 25, who were involved in this medium at that point, trying to do adult work, if you want to call it that. And it was quite a wide range of approaches, but ultimately everybody was kind of on the same page that what you were trying to do was get away from fantasy. Comics had always been about fantasy, had always been about spaceships and rockets, or rockets and, and superheroes and laser guns and monsters. And as much as I have a deep affection for all that genre stuff, um, that was not what we wanted to do. We clearly wanted to differentiate ourselves from the work that had been made for the pop culture. And the obvious answer to differentiate yourself away from pop culture is, and fantasy is to go much closer to dealing with like mundane real life. Um, these two guys uh, were, I was lucky enough that they both lived in Toronto when I was there. And it was a great experience to be able to sit down with two people who are doing the same thing you're doing around sort of the same holy cause. And where you can sit down and actually hash out what everything means. Like why, what is a good comic? Like it's, you know, once you're trying to do something like that, you have to start having some criteria of what it's about. And um, it really was, an, it, it's a, a, like a, at that age, when you're in your early 20s and you have, you know, to really try and hash that out, it's exciting to be, to start making rules about why the art, what makes good art, and then learn to later how you, to break those rules yourself once you've had them for a while. I can remember that we were very, very attached to the idea that you must never use any narration. You would always, everything had to be shown. So if somebody was walking from the kitchen to the bedroom, you couldn't have a box that said, later in the bedroom. You had to show the character who walked there. That always meant you had to add in two pages of artwork. Um, another thing was you were not, no thought balloons. People, you can't read people's thoughts in real life, so that's out. Um, and these kind of rules later, of course, are exactly the sort of thing that after you've been working for 10 years, you say like, well, why can't I have a thought balloon? I'm gonna put thought balloons back in. Uh, but it's important to hash that stuff out and also hash out to say like who's who's doing good work and why is the work good? Why would I want to emulate that? Anyhow, oh sorry, that uh, that last image was just Chester's book uh, Louis Riel, which was a, a very successful graphic novel memoir of uh, or a history of, of, uh, of Louis Riel. Um, he was known in those years for doing a book called Yummy Fur, and. Um, Chet was a huge influence on me because if anything he, he really taught me was like how to be understated. Comics is not an understated medium. It's actually, it's a very misunderstood medium really because I think most people think of comics as being uh, basically just words and pictures put together that, as simple as that, that it's, or often people use the uh, uh, comparison that it's like a combination of prose and uh, film techniques. But uh, really it's not. Um, Cartooning is like a language of its own, and that's the thing that you learn the more you do it, is that yes, they are drawings, and yes, there are words, but um, that when you start putting them together, they, they, it's actually more that the pictures are symbols, just like the words are. You start to realize that you compose a comics page the same way you compose a sentence. You take these symbols that mean things, like a bunch of letters, and put them together into words, and then you put the words together into sentences. With comics, that's what you're doing on the page. You might be drawing a picture of a house and a guy walking to the house and he's got a word balloon over his head saying something, but actually the, the way you're designing it and putting it together, you're really moving <coughs> shapes around on the page that represent things. Especially the more you draw as a cartoonist, the simpler it gets, I think, and they become more and more like icons rather than like fully realized illustrations. I often refer to it as memory drawing. It's the way that in your mind you reduce images to um, simpler forms. When you imagine something that happened in the past, you have a way of constructing that memory in your brain. You pull the details in together, sort of. You say like, oh yes, I was in high school and I remember the classroom and there I was and the teacher was at the front. You start to compose the actual mental image of this thing and then you sort of set it into play. And a lot of cartooning is like that. The page is actually more, draw, it's more about graphic design than it is about drawing. You can do a comic page where it's beautiful paintings in every panel, but I always think of that as kind of bad cartooning. That slows down the, the, the experience. If you're looking at the drawings and thinking about them, then the cartoonist did a bad job. You shouldn't think about them much. You should read the comic. You might say they're beautiful, you might like it. The cartoonist wants them to be beautiful. You still try to make a pretty page. 
but you don't want people to get either confused or to get held up on the drawings. It's just the same as the words. It's like if you were reading a book and you thought about the typeface through the whole book, then somebody has done a bad job of setting up that book. And this is some of Joe's work. Now Joe works strictly in autobiography, and this was a period when a lot of people were trying autobiography. I did some of it myself. Joe's work was very funny. Um, mine was never funny. I've never been very funny. Um, and Chester's work was very funny sometimes and very surreal. Um, around this time, autobiography was, um, was very popular amongst my generation because it was, like I said, the most obvious way to write to be away from fantasy would be to write about your own life. And I started out doing that. And my first couple of comics I did were literally like stories from my own life. I think the first one I was at something about where I'd been beaten up in the street, and the second story was about an affair I'd had with a married woman. And both of these comics, when I finished them, I was unsatisfied with them ultimately. And I wasn't sure why I was unsatisfied beyond the obvious reasons you often don't like your own work. But I realized it's because the, the stories weren't like, there wasn't enough meat on the bones in a way. It's like when you see it, you read a book or see a movie, something like that, where you, at the end, where you're, it's made a true connection to you, is because there's some sense of the profound in the work. Something that is um, beyond the, the simple, like, uh, construction of plot and, and characters. There's something intangible in it. And I felt that I was, like, too focused on telling a story in these. They were like an anecdote. Both those comics would have been fine to tell if I was out to coffee with someone as a story, but they weren't good they weren't a good way to impart the experience of being alive. And so immediately after that, I started a different story, which was this comic called It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken. Now, ostensibly, this, this had a plot to it in that I was searching for an old cartoonist in the story, but what I was trying to do was get away from plot because uh, that was what was so boring about those other comics is that they were too plot-oriented. So I really wanted to find some way to tell stories that were much slower and were much um, quieter, that were more about um, the interior experience of how you think, uh, were more about dreams, memories, um, the subtleties between people when they're talking, and um, about time. And so in this comic, I really slowed things down. For example, in this sequence here, I think it's about six or seven pages, and what that serves as a purpose is it serves for two years past in the story there. So it's you read those very slowly, like you look through them, and you, you have to decide why am I seeing these images of the seasons changing, of these things. And it's like, I could have just said two years later, but it was very important for the tone and the feeling of what I was trying to impart to really slow down the reading experience. Um, because comics are the kind of thing that traditionally were very fast is another element of it. You forget this because there's been a tremendous amount of experimentation in comics now, but, but back when I was starting out, you might, like the kind of comics you read, like you might be reading a Superman comic, and in panel one, he's in his bedroom, and on panel two, he's on the moon. It was like they didn't have any time to show him flying to the moon. They only had six pages to tell the story, so they had to get going. Um, now you could have as much time as you wanted. That was one of the great revolutions of working in comics at that point, was you could literally say, I want to tell a, a story that's 100 pages or 200 pages. It was very liberating to be freed from those six page um, limits. Um, so you could, I remember around this time, somebody told me about a manga they'd seen from Japan where someone had spent 40 pages on a single kiss. I've never seen this manga. I've been looking for it for years. But, but the important thing was, whether it was true or not, is that that really was like a very inspirational idea. It's like, wow, you can do whatever you like. And if you feel that it deserves to, you know, that much space, you could do it. And that technique of learning to slow down, that decision to slow down, has pretty much informed most of what my work is about, because my work is very small. It's about little things. Um, I tend to think like my work is literally about like the contents of a room. That could be like a 200 page novel if I had, you know, in fact, it sounds like a good idea to me. Now, and there's, there's the cover of that book. After I did um, It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken, that was a good learning experience for me. That really did teach me 
to sort of like use the narrative in a different way than I had been using it before. But even after that, I still thought, I want this a lot slower, what I was doing. And so that's when I started this book, Clyde Fans. Now, I started Clyde Fans, I think, in 1997. And I just finished it this year. So uh, it, was, it was actually slower in many ways than I planned. Um, I just wanted a slow story, but it took me a long time to do it. But basically, what, what I, the innovation for me in this process was learning that I had the freedom to throw out the rules of plot entirely. So I would say that this story doesn't have a plot in the least. It's just a bunch of stuff, which is a lot of what life is like, too. I think um, it's kind of funny to talk about your career because it implies that like, you kind of knew what you were doing or that things were planned out ahead. And um, that's certainly not the case. I look back on this now and I see these as all logical progressions. But when I started working back in the 80s, I thought I was going to do different kind of work than I did. Um, I thought I would do a couple of like real life stories and maybe I would do a romance or maybe I would do something, you know, you have a bunch of ideas like I'll do something like uh, kind of hard edged. You don't realize that um, you ha you're going to end up finding your own voice at some point in your own work and that will take you somewhere um, that you don't plan. I mean, a lot of times people ask like, where did you get your, where do you, how do you get your style? Or why do you, you know, why do you write about these sort of things? And uh, it implies that a decision was made. Um, but the interesting thing is I don't think you do make a decision. Um, I recall when I was in art school and I was, tr I was learning, um, trying to figure out how to draw comics, um, I didn't have the style I work in now. I was looking around for a style and I remember I was doing a bunch of different approaches. I had a lot of pages where I was trying to do this thing sort of like Edward Gore, <laughs> you know him, with very little cross-hatched lines very finicky little work, and I was doing some other stuff that was really graphic and trying to be very, like, new wavy. And, um, and then I was learning this sort of brush style that I was uh, trying to incorporate and studying the Hernandez brothers, and it was all over the place. And I remember thinking, like, what's it going to be? Which style am I picking? And um, the funny part about that process is, at some point, it just, the style picks you. There was some point where I stopped thinking about it, and, and then I realized, oh, this is my style. Uh, and I think just about every cartoonist I've talked to, it's the same thing. You go through a process of imitating. You, tr you know, you're trying to learn to figure it out. You think you're making conscious decisions towards it, but somehow or other, it has a life of its own. And then the other part of it is, is after you figure that style out and do it for a little while, you spend the rest of your life trying to get away from it because uh, once it gets locked in, it's very, very hard to shake something like that. And I don't think I've ever met another cartoonist who didn't tell me that next year they were going to be working in a different style, and it never happens. Um, but in the, back to Clyde Fans, though. The key thing I wanted to do in Clyde Fans was slow things down, but also I wanted to like focus so much on place that uh, the, whole, the whole book takes place in this one office building, with an office with some rooms over top. And uh, I wanted the, to do, have the experience of the characters moving through those spaces so much that you as the reader would eventually know the spaces as well as they do. To really focus on the details of regular life. And uh, more and more as I get older, I realize that that is, you, that's like where your, con your, your story material comes up in the same way as a style. It's like I didn't, when I made that plan about the building, didn't realize that a story about two depressed old men who never leave the house, I didn't think that was going to be every story I wrote from then on, but it is. Um, these, you really, it teaches you who you are, is the funny thing. There's a storefront, and here are just some examples of some of the pages. Like, and, and another thing is, um, this, in this book, I wanted to try and um, explore working from different narrative <coughs> approaches, too. So I wanted to say there's five chapters in the book, and um, I will try to approach each chapter so that it is somehow structurally different from the others, but not in an obvious way. And so, for example, I knew that I wanted each of the chapters to somehow... Let's put it this way. The first chapter is all... The two characters are Abraham and Simon. And the first chapter is all Abraham speaking directly to the reader. The second chapter is all um, Simon in a style of, of storytelling which you 
I call like naturalistic storytelling. You follow him around. He doesn't speak to you to you directly as a reader. He, he is everything's like it's in the real world, like you're a ghost following a person, like most movies are. Uh, and in the third chapter, I wanted to change it so that um, it was all inside Simon. So in that comic, it's all like interior dialogue. And then the fourth one is the fine is where you finally bring the two characters together. So you have a conversation. It's the fourth chapter. And then the fifth chapter is um, a sort of a mystical hallucinatory experience. So each of those chapters gave me an opportunity to like do something um, narratively different. And um, so in the first chapter, you have Abraham talking directly to the reader for 80 or 90 pages. And um, I remember when I worked on this, um, I thought to myself, like, uh, well, how am I going to do that? Like, how is that? Is that is, do I want narration over his head that he's just narrating? Do I want to use those thought balloons I don't really like? And then I remember I was reading at that point a lot of these old comics of a little character called Little Lulu. And uh, she had a little friend named Tubby. And Tubby, I noticed when I was reading them, was often running around on his own talking to himself. And I would say, like, well, who's he talking to? Because he'd be saying, oh, I've got to get home, got to get there before Lulu gets there. Stuff like that. And you realize, well, this is just a completely normal comics narrative technique. We understand Tubby's not talking to anyone. He's talking to himself. It's so that we, the audience, know what's going on. So I just thought, I'll just simply and directly, I'm just going to do that. Why not just have the character talking aloud? He's not saying he's talking to the reader, but obviously nobody walks around and talks for two or three hours in complete sentences. But um, that's a kind of freeing thing when you allow yourself to just do whatever you want and not worry about preconceptions. Comics have been good for that, like I said. No editors to tell you you shouldn't do that, or that doesn't make sense, or maybe you should rethink that. <coughs> and these are just more images from the comic. This is from the second chapter where Simon's walking around. Third chapter, some other scenes. There we go. I don't know why I have so many of those slides. Um, now this is a this is from my sketchbook. This is actually drawing my wife. But um, I just have this up here because um, when talking about your career as a cartoonist, one of the important things is that um, it's a visual medium. And as, a, and as an artist, it's always important to, um, to work in sketchbooks. These are just some images from them. Actually, I don't know if you can see that well, but that's Hamilton Road. Um, anyhow, the point being, and I think this is a point that is um, transferable to any of the arts, is that it's, I've always considered it very important to do work that isn't directly related to the finished product. Uh, we all, you know, like you can always say like, um, a lot of people just, you know, I write one novel and then I write another one right after and it's like everything is part of a process of finished work. But for myself, a lot of what I do comes out of um, a process of playing around. I call these hobbies or, um, I remember the writer Max Bierbaum, um, he was once described, his life was described as a life of all play. And I always liked that because I thought it, it's like it's different than the life of all work. It takes you out of, you're not in the ivory tower, you're actually more in the playroom. And the playroom is actually a good place to be as an artist because a certain lack of pretension is helpful in figuring out what you're doing. And being a cartoonist was good because right from the beginning there was a lack of pretension. It was looked down on as a kind of a, the gum chewers medium. So there's something about working on side projects that teaches you things you cannot learn by doing the finished work. So sketchbooks, I have, I have many of these sort of side projects where I fool around with things and they lead you somewhere. Um, I'll show you some other stuff as it comes up here. But um, the sketchbook, of course, is the logical place where you, as a, as a cartoonist, you would work. So a lot of drawing, a lot of painting, trying to do things that would be slightly in a different vein than the way I do the actual work. Just, you know, it was not, nothing meant to be like for the ages, just fiddling around. And uh, I did many sketchbooks in that approach, mostly single image uh, drawings, uh, fill up a sketchbook with them, and then eventually at some point I published um, a, a book of those sketches. And um, that was probably, I don't know, about 2001, something like that. And when that book came out, it was interesting uh, how suddenly I lost all interest in doing that kind of work, almost overnight. 
when I went back to the sketchbooks, I found I was bored. Uh, somehow the publishing it as a book had kind of culminated that approach into something that seemed redundant. Now, I certainly do still fill sketchbooks up that way, but what it immediately made me do was start to draw comic strips in my sketchbooks. Up until then, I'd never really done much comics work in a rough way. I'd always done it exactly like I was saying, where you'd, like, you'd sit down and you'd plan out a complete page, which is laborious, you know, you, you design it out, then you, you pencil it all, you ink it all, uh, a lot of whiteout, correcting things up. It's not, a, it's, not like, it's not like playing around at all. It's very much like producing a graphic design. But doing the stuff in the sketchbooks was the exact opposite. I would just start in the top corner and just start going. Just say, like, make it up panel by panel. And that's why, typically, a lot of this stuff I did at this point, are, the panels are all the same size. I didn't want to get concerned with designing pages. I just wanted, like, let's just write. Um, this was a very freeing experience. I, didn't, I wasn't too sure that I was actually going to enjoy it because it's more work than drawing one picture on a page. But uh, it turned out to be uh, very freeing because uh, suddenly I now felt uh, I didn't have that urge to produce art with a capital A. A lot of working on the, uh, the, the comics and the graphic novels was very much about proving a point that comics could be art. And, um, and that meant a certain seriousness of tone. And, um, and a certain seriousness of approach that once I started working in the sketchbook and doing strips, I was just like, well, I don't ever have to show these to anybody if I don't like them. There's not like when you do work for print where you know it's going to be published. And uh, that was freeing, and I actually started to do different kinds of work. That's when I did start, I started the work that became, eventually became this book called Wimbledon Green, The Greatest Comic Book Collector in the World. Um, and this book is, um, was, when I produced it, it was seriously just uh, to amuse myself. It was fun. It was an absurd, big, silly character who runs around the world like um, it's, it's more like he's um, he's a you know a millionaire comic book collector who flies around in an auto gyro with like you know um, exotic um, sidekicks who help him find old comic books. Uh, it was a very silly comic, and it made fun a lot of like the whole world of comics and collectors. But it was just for me. And, um, and when I finished it up, I showed it to my publisher, and he was interested in publishing it, and I wasn't really too sure whether I wanted to because it was very different from what I usually do, and I was kind of afraid that it was stupid. Um, but I, I went with it, and I published it, and it's funny how that's another element of like taking a risk maybe with yourself, is that when it came out, a lot of people liked it a lot better than my more serious work. And it made me realize, um, it kind of freed me up too from worrying about the work being stupid. Uh, and uh, since then I feel like, I pretty much feel like I've finally reached the point where I've stopped caring about the reader. Even though I never cared much about the reader. Um, I always cared enough that I thought, I cared what they thought of me. And this may just be a process of getting older too, but you reach a point where you start to say like, um, it's, a, it's funny, it's, uh, how do I explain this? It may take 20 years to get to a point where you actually are doing what you think you want to do, because you don't know what you want to do. Um, right now, I feel like I'm starting to write stories, telling myself, what would you, what is the thing you most want to read? And then write it. Now, that's the advice that I gave myself 20 years ago. And I thought I was doing that each time. But as I look back on the books, I generally realize there's still something in there where I thought, I had to have this in or the reader will be bored or I had to have this kind of transition because they might not understand, or each of these elements that you slowly you toss them out one by one, but you don't toss them out on day one. It's a long process to figure out what you want to write about. A long process figuring out who you are. These are some pages from Wimbledon Green. As you can see, uh, they're not as boring uh, as the previous sketchbook page because I started to feel like I could compose slightly more interesting pages on the fly. And that's just, actually, I don't know why that slide's in there. That is a slide of some of my comics I drew when I was a child. Um, now, these slides are kind of random, so this is not much point. These are just some paintings I did, but maybe what they do is um, I'll show them to you here. I'm not sure why I have them in this particular... Oh, I know why. Basically, I'm just showing other things I do. But it does sort of allow me to, I guess, talk a bit about the fact that um, a lot of my work is about the past. As you saw in those paintings, they're all kind of classic mid-20th century images. Um, 
I kind of call them icons because they have gold backgrounds, much like uh, a traditional icon. Although I didn't paint them with that in mind, but later I thought that was a catchy name for them. Uh, this is another aspect of, um, I guess, explaining who you are, is that um, everything is about identity. And it doesn't seem obvious. Uh, I mean, it was obvious for me at a certain point in my life where I started to pick things to be my identity. I mean, when I was a punk, I'd made uh, five minutes? Yeah, OK. Um, so enough about my identity. I'm going to talk, <laughs> talk about something else. You know. I'm going to show you, this is the city of Dominion. Now, this is what I was talking about, side projects. And I will roll through this, because I think this is at the core of what I'm interested in and what I think, how I think about writing. And that is that um, a few, about 10 years ago, I started to write a new graphic novel. And um, I was going to have five stories with five different characters. And at some point, I thought to myself, I need something to unify this into a story. So why don't I put them all in the same town, and then I will, uh, that'll be the clever bit, that they all live in the same town, but they don't actually ever interact with each other. Uh, as I was working it out, I thought to myself, well, it might be good if I knew something about the town they lived in, and maybe I should have a little history of the town as the first chapter. And so I thought, okay. I thought, well, I guess I'll have to make up the history of this town. And I thought, well, how do you make up the history of, uh, well, really, it was a city. It's about 300,000 people. So I thought, well, I could do it in the most obvious way and just say, like, in 1832, Jebediah something came out of the bush and chopped down a tree. And I thought, but that's the most boring way to do it. So what I would do is, I'm going, I've got lots of time. I was working on Clyde fans. I still had 10 more years to go. So I thought, um, what I'll do is I will make up a business. I'll write it in a little notebook. I'll pick something randomly. I think the very first place I picked was the ice cream store. And I will make up what the history of that little ice cream store is. And then after that, I'll pick something else and make up its history. And over time, these things will start to connect somehow. It will just happen. Um, and while I was working on the second or third little business, I think, I decided to make a little cardboard model of it uh, for fun. And also because I thought it will give me some time while I'm making this little model to figure out in my head what the business's history is. It'll be a bit more something to do rather than to sit in a chair and think. And um, that started this project of Dominion, which is the name of that town. So Dominion is has eventually reached a point now where there's, I think, about 100 of them. And um, it, where it was literally a basement project, at some point it came out into the real world when a curator came over and saw it, and then it ended up going into galleries, and now it's been in many galleries. But the essential element of the project is still the notebooks, not the buildings. That process of making things up worked, and then eventually things did start to connect. At some point, natural connections occurred where you would realize that the man who owned the typewriter company was also the guy who financed the television station. And then you would realize that you, when you're filling out who's in the graveyard, you'd start to make connections. You go, oh, okay, well, this is an important person in this graveyard would be so and so. Why are they important? And bit by bit by bit, it started to build together. And eventually, at some point, I had a map. And then eventually, at some point, the map had streets on it. And then at some point, I started to know where the buildings were on the map. And I started to know the social history of the place. And that's when it took off in its own direction. And and the point of that is, of course, you don't need that much background information to write anything. Well, the other thing is I stuck, I never wrote that graphic novel. Um, the, the five characters disappeared entirely, but the city took over. And now when I write anything, everything that happens in Dominion. And that, having that much background information is great because you're never going to use it in anything you write, but you know exactly where everything is and you know the context where your characters are. So when I have like one of my characters, like George Sprott, I think he's in here. George, when he was going down the street, I knew exactly where he was going. When he turned the corner, I knew what was there. And I knew the cultural history of George. And, um, and that kind of thing, I think it's like, my point being, since I should, I'm getting to the point where I better wrap this up, is that um, it's important to take these kind of side um, hobbies, whatever you want to call them, and let them explore themselves because you never know where they'll lead and there's always a kind of a threshold point in anything you're doing 
that teaches you something you could not have learned in a more rational approach. So I will close this up by going to the last, we've got one more little cartoon, and then maybe we can, if there's any time, we'll ask a question. Or do you want to straight your questions? Okay, well maybe we better do the questions then rather than the cartoon. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's see. Does anyone have a question? And as I always say, please, someone start. Sure. Um, way back at the beginning, you said that it was a very, this is amazing, that turned it into pure fiction. Um, so could you tell me what makes fiction pure? Uh, did, I say, did I say pure fiction? Ah, uh, there, that was a mistake. Um, <laughs> No, I think there's no such thing as pure fiction. And Linda Berry wasn't writing pure fiction either. I suppose pure fiction would be fiction that you completely made up out of your head, but I don't know how anybody could do that. Everything's based on life experience to some degree. Even when you look into like, you know, the most absurd characters, like, you know, the superhero characters or something, a lot of times under the surface there's some very interesting insight into who those people were. But for Linda Berry, I think what surprised me was that that work read like direct autobiography. I figured she was changing the characters' names, that Maybaum was really uh, Linda. Um, and then I was a little disappointed later when I found out that it was invention. But then later, as I've read more and more of her work over the years, she realized there's no real invention either because some of the stuff she wrote later that was directly autobiographical was very much the same tone and very much the same details. And so I guess the truth is, the, the, there's a blurred edge always between truth and fiction. When, when you're trying to uh, figure out different writing and uh, illustration styles, what were some of the some of the things you're thinking about that kind of made you want to, or mm -hmm. that you that you put in your head to change your thought process? Yeah, well, I guess at that point, one of the big things for me as, as a cartoonist was I was trying to get influence from outside the field I was working in. So, so obviously I wasn't looking, even though as, as, as impressed as I was as Lin, with Linda Berry or with Harvey Pekar or something, I think more what I was getting from them was inspiration. Yeah. When I sat down and I thought, like, you know, what is my writing going to be about, besides the fact that I was trying it to be from real experience, I was, you know, influenced mostly by, by authors, I think, at that point, and filmmakers. Um, back then, I think the, the big author for me at that age was J.D. Salinger, um, which, that tone was very appealing to me at that point. I find that funny because I reread all of Salinger a couple of years ago and I couldn't stand it. Um, I found it was so irritating. But at the time, it was really, really like, um, I can, much of what I was doing, I was almost trying to like, speak Salinger's um, sensibility in my brain. And, but that was a big period, too, of just exploring. So I can remember that I was a pretty unsophisticated kid when I came out of that small town. So I was reading a lot of, you know, everybody. Uh, everyone from Nabokov to Kafka to uh, Kimo, whatever. And I, I think a lot of it really was I wanted something with ambition, something that would make me try harder and that was much you know, from coming from people who were different, very different from me, but to try and learn from like that level of sophistication. And the same with film. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I want to ask you to join me in thanking Seth for uh, you know, giving us such a glimpse into a really creative life and what it takes to have a creative life. So thanks for coming, everyone. And uh, there are some books here. And once again, thank you so much, Seth.